Philippians 2. We're going to be there in Philippians 2. And I mean, uh, this whole chapter is an interesting chapter. It's a powerful chapter. Uh, we'll be going through most of it, uh, if not all of it. But uh, the title of my message this afternoon is Humility versus Pride. Humility versus Pride. And one of the things that I'm going to be focused on for the next couple of weeks is just talking about the sins or the attitude that the world has, especially in this month. And this is specifically for this month. You know, uh, we're, preach we're, uh, we're coming up on June 2nd and starting yesterday, we started getting bombarded with all this filth and junk and perverseness and just uh, wickedness from the world trying to shove down our throats and trying to convince us that we should celebrate, you know, the, the perverseness that is these queers and these fags that go around promoting this lifestyle of perversion that the Lord hates and it says is worthy of, of, uh, worthy of death. But the reason that I'm preaching today on humility and pride is because it, it takes a certain attitude to get there. I mean, if you read in Romans 1, it says that they're proud. But also, it's just that, you know, the whole month is named Pride Month. So, you know, I just wanted to do a contrast of the attitudes that you have and why you get to that level, you know, and why you get to that point. You know, I mean, it, it, Christ humbled himself for us. We're going to see this in this passage and the world seems to uh, want to puff itself up and be proud and uh, fill itself with pride. And, it, uh, and it's, it's like the, one of the major roads to hell. You know, Jesus Christ is the way to heaven and everything else seems to lead that way. But one of the things that we have in this country right now is we're, we have individuals that are full of pride that keep promoting pride to other individuals. I mean, we can start all the way from the, the top office on down in my political structures, but we also see it in churches, even in, in uh, independent fundamental circles. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm almost done. I'll probably finish reading it tonight. There's a book uh, written by a pastor by the name of Stacy uh, Shiflett, and he wrote about how he, as a child or as a young man, um, teenager, he was abused by these perverts, by these pedophiles, and how over time he's uh, taken a stand against this type of abuse and how it's uh, something that is just rampant in not only independent fundamental circles, but just in, in uh, religion in, in general. And we can see it from the Catholics to the Presbyterians to just, you name the religion, and they have this kind of immorality because what happens is the individuals, the office of the bishop, you know, they get them as a novice and it puffs them up. They're filled with pride. You know, the Bible warns us about that. But right now, let's just get, let's, let's start looking there and let's really contrast humility versus pride. It's an interesting study. And it's something that we're going to point out. We're going to bring it into relevance of today and just what's going on with this month and the type of things. And, and what I want to do is show you that humility is not weakness. And humility uh, should encourage you to go out there and fight the good fight. I mean, we need more humble, uh, faithful soldiers of Christ to fight the fight, the good fight uh, of the Lord. So let's go there to Philippians 2, verse 1. It says, and these are the verses that we're focused on. Uh, verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So let's just stop right there. We're not even of one mind when you, you get with independent fundamental Baptists, let alone with those individuals. Let's just go outside that circle. Yeah, uh, you know, that say that they believe on Jesus Christ and have the right gospel, but you're missing a lot of areas there. And, and, and I think it's because they're not completely sold out to the authority of the Bible and to what the Bible says about every subject, not just the good subjects, the ones we like to hear. The Bible tells us there in, in verse 3, let's keep reading, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. The Bible tells us to esteem others and to look also on, on the affairs of others. I mean, there's no better uh, way to do that than to have a protective attitude towards the innocent or those that just don't have the ability to defend themselves and to have a, follow, uh, a follower's attitude to the strong leaders that are standing up against sin. And if there is no strong leaders, then you should have a strong leadership. Uh, uh, you should have the ability to lead in that fight. But let's keep moving on. It says there in uh, verse number five, so that, let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in, the, in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. And so we see here that every knee is going to bow one day. And what's interesting is that in this majesty, in this powerful picture that we see here of Jesus Christ coming and thought, thinking not robbery to be equal to God, but he came and conquered death and he was obedient unto death, that you see this powerful statement that says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And so it's important for us to understand, look, if Jesus humbled himself and there came power behind that, then we should humble ourselves to Christ and earn, uh, or not earn, but receive that power and, and uh, go out there and execute that power on the evil and wickedness of this world. And, and let me make that, receive that power, because, I mean, obviously salvation is by faith alone. We don't earn it. I don't want anybody, even though I'm not talking about that, uh, you earn rewards, but the power that comes from humbling yourself is in obedience to the fact that you're, you're trusting your life to Jesus Christ and nothing else matters. And you're willing to stand on every word, every tittle, every uh, cross T, every dotted I in the Word of God. So we see this, this picture right here, but let's just uh, first focus on the problem. Before I give you the solution, you know, the problem, and, and we're doing a contrast, but the, the contrast is the problem and the solution. The problem is that pride gets in the way. You know, I had a conversation with someone earlier this week, and what's interesting is, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background. So there's this uh, acquaintance I know from a previous job uh, through uh, the pe Basically, I know this guy from, from the past, and he keeps in touch with me every once in a while. And he called me up uh, a few days ago, and he asked me if, if the church had any volunteer work uh, to do, you know, clean or cut the grass or anything. I said, well, what, what is it that you're looking to do? Or he wasn't asking for a job. It turns out that he has a nephew who's 14 years old who's being a little rebellious, and he wants to give him some manual labor or just put him to work uh, as a form of punishment and discipline. And I said, well, you know, right now the church doesn't have anything. The grass is not that long, and, you know, we just cleaned the church. We just had a cleaning church day. But every time he calls me, I ask him about his, the state of his salvation, and I said, hey, you know, is your nephew saved? And he said, why? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, look, are you saved? And I asked him if he was saved again. He's like, well, why are you always asking me that? I've always answered that question to you. And I said, yeah, but you've never answered it correctly. And I mean, uh, not to be a jerk or anything, but you're asking me to help this guy out. And the main thing I'm concerned about is his salvation. And if you're going to lead by example with him, he needs a father figure or at least a, a good uh, male role model and there's no better role model than someone who's saved by Jesus Christ who's doing the work of the Lord. And he's like, no, no, I'm saved. And I said, well, do you believe that you can lose your salvation? And he's like, well, you know, it depends. I mean, if you do something really bad. I said, see, you're not saved. I said, the challenge with you, you call me all the time with uh, things like this. And the problem, and I just was finally really blunt with him because, you know, we don't have time to waste in this world. And I said, the, the challenge with you is that you're prideful that pride gets in the way. He goes, what do you mean I'm prideful? I'm probably the most humble individual you're ever going to meet. And I said, that's exactly the point. Anybody who's humble would never say that they're prideful. And I told him, I said, you, you really need to get this thing of salvation right. I said, and then you also need to get it right with those that are, that are you know, with your kids and your family members. What's interesting is a couple of days later, I was able to talk to his teenage son and his teenage son rejected the Lord. I mean, his teenage son let me go through the entire presentation. He prayed the sinner's prayer. And when I asked him if he believed the words that he prayed, he said no. And, and he was, uh, you know, and I think it's just because he's following his father's example. But what's, the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of long in this, long-winded in this story is because today, uh, the, uh, the girlfriend of that guy brought, she comes to this church and she brought that nephew with, with her. She brought him with us, or with us, with him. And I was able 
to pull him aside after church and give him the gospel, and he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the world will look at that and, and be like, well, he's rebellious and, and he's really hard to deal with. But God's going to look at that as he's a sinner that's saved by grace through Jesus Christ. You know, look at the contrast. Even though these guys think that they have their life together, this father and son duo, they're lost and going to hell. And this guy who they look down upon because they think he's a rebellious 14-year-old who's just like any 14-year-old without any direction. You know, you take any 14-year-old boy and you don't give him any discipline and direction, and guess what? you got a rebellious child. I mean, that's just the, the fact of the matter. He's not any worse or any better than any other 14-year-old who has no discipline. And But the guy was receptive and open to the Word of God, and today he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reason is because he was able to humble himself and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and remove that pride and remove that belief that he could have anything to do with his salvation. On the other hand, you have... Pride that gets in the way of your salvation. But why this long story? Because one of the reasons that the young man, the son of this guy, didn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ is because his dad and his mom got divorced. And he had prayed to God in the past as a younger child that they shouldn't get divorced. And he asked God to do that. And when his parents got divorced, he said that God turned his back on him and didn't answer his question. And, and I brought this up in the morning, but you know, he's never been taught the Bible because preachers have stopped preaching the Word of God and saying, look, yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, the Bible talks about how difficult your life will be on this earth, how you'll be persecuted and reproached for the name of Christ. And then the other thing you see is how God answers prayers according to God's will, not your will. It's not you sit there and ask God, you know, I need this and I need that. You say, God, let your will be done in my life. And you say, well, what does that have to do with the whole month, the whole month of June Pride? Well, look, I believe that if the preachers that were preaching hard back in the day wouldn't have stopped preaching hard and said, look, divorce is a sin and you shouldn't get divorced. And if people were preaching from the pulpits and if family members were, were exhorting their family members that sit, that's a type of sin that's not uh, accepted in the Bible, that you shouldn't leave your wife and commit adultery and that you shouldn't leave a, a trail of hurt and and anguish behind with children and family members that are hurt because of the situation, we wouldn't get to the point where at some point in history, we've now hit divorces just like a dime a dozen. It's not even looked, it's not even frowned upon. You know, when people, when my parents were growing up, my mom tells me that divorce was a big deal. Like the whole neighborhood and everybody in the community would know and it, it just was really frowned upon. Now people are like, oh, you're getting divorced. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope it works out for you. Well, then that, that gives people pride to continue in that sin and you're just sliding down to the pit of hell and you're taking other people with you. You know, if you start out with divorce, then all of a sudden it's okay to be in an adulterous relationship. Then if you're not an adulteress, then you're fornicating. And if you're not fornicating, then guess what? You're, you're no longer interested in the natural and you leave the natural use of the man and the woman and you end up where we are today, where people are like, we should just allow them to get married, and we should allow them to have kids, and we should allow them, allow them to live like we do. The challenge is they don't live like we do, and they don't act like we do, and they don't care for children like we do, and they, they don't care to protect them and educate them and train them up in the way that they should go and admon in the admonishment and fear of the Lord. They're there to destroy, and they're there to destroy families, and, the reasons, and one of the reasons that, that uh, starts is with pride. And it's not the only reason, but it's a good reason to start because that's the whole, that's the, the theme of the month for the world. It's called Pride Month. And let's just take a look here at the word pride. The word pride, you know, I'm just giving you a basic definition, but we're also going to look at what the Bible does that backs this up. You know, I don't, I don't just pull definitions at random. Actually, I prefer to have a definition that is consistent with the Word of God. I'm not going to let the world define what God says, but let the, 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 word, the Bible define what, uh, what the uh, word means. But pride is just an inordinate self-esteem, an unreasonable conceit of one's own superior, su superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishment, rank, or elevation in office, office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. What's interesting is the way they word this here. That's why it's so interesting. You've got to be careful. With it. it says that their, their own superior, superiority in talents, their own. 
That's their perception. That doesn't mean that they're more talented, that they're more beautiful, that they're more wealthy, more accomplished. That's just the way that they think that they are. And they often hold others in contempt. So when you're talking about Pride Month, you're talking about individuals who look down if you don't accept their lifestyle, if you're not with them in this lifestyle, this wicked lifestyle. It says, uh, insolence, rude treatment of others, insolent exaltation, uh, generous elation of the heart, a noble self-esteem springing from a conscious of worth. Basically, uh, there's other, uh, ex uh, I, I think it's interesting here, because you know you also have a pride of animals, you know, like a pride of, of lions and stuff. And the, the eighth one is the excitement of, a, of the sexual appetite and female beast. And the Bible actually refers to the uh, sodomite as a beast, as brute beasts. You know, these individuals that are no longer uh, human in their attributes. And we, we see that the definition aligns with what, with what we're looking at here. Um, Another, another little bit of the definition is we see uh, that they, they like to indulge or take pride in, in oneself or self-gratification. Uh, you know, it's very all about me. It's almost, it's a very narcissistic mentality. Nobody defines this probably better right now out there in the world than Donald Trump. I mean, I hate to say it because I know that as an independent fundamental Baptist, I should probably be uh, red-blooded Republican, and I should probably have, uh, you know, my TiVo, maybe I'm dating myself now, I think you can record different now, but I should have my, my cable, if I had cable, uh, set to record, and only, like, my presets should all be like Fox Baptist News, Fox, Fox News, Fox this, Fox that, Fox everything. But the reality is that, you know, the, the conservative movement of today has nothing to do with the Bible. As a matter of fact, if God looked down, if you just look based on God's Word, you know, their movement compared to what God says is, is like night and day. It's light and darkness. And so I just pulled up an article here before we get to the verses. In the meantime, turn to Proverbs 16. We're going to be going over quite a bit of scripture, but turn to Proverbs 16. We're going to take a look at quite a bit here. But uh, I looked up and there's a ton of articles out there about how Pride Month got started and all this. But this was a really good synopsis because it covered everything I wanted to cover. You know, uh, it, 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 it was written May 31st, it was only two days ago, at 219, and it's, uh, I think this is uh, uh, NBC News. It says, Trump recognizes LGBTQ Pride Month for the first time. And it's true, the, the first two years of his office, he didn't recognize it. So, you know, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The first thing we see is there's that flip-flopping instability that, that uh, Trump brings to the table as the leader of the free world, supposedly, right? Pr the president did not recognize Pride Month for the first two years of his presidency after promising he would support the LGBT community. Now, why you say Trump? You say, look, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. I believe in, in the word of God, so I'm not going to let a, the president tell me. Maybe you, you're not, but there's a lot of Southern Baptist and Baptist by name and Methodist and, and uh, Presbyterians and Catholics that all think and even uh, just... Uh, non-denomination contemporary churches that all think that they're conservative and that they're red-blooded Republicans and that they'll turn a blind eye to this as long as Trump is the one that God called into office and even though God does appoint the leaders in office it's not always for a good thing you know we see in the Bible multiple times where you know you see God's I mean uh, kings anointed for good and kings anointed for bad so we have to actually look at the entire council of God to see where this is headed you know, we look at, uh, and we're going to continue, I'm not going to read the whole article for you, but uh, it's something that he didn't do in the first two years of his presidency. Then he, I think this is a tweet, as we celebrate LGBT Pride Month and recognize the outstanding contributions LGBT people have made to our great nation. What? Let us also stand in solidarity with many LGBT people who live who live in my administration, uh, who live in and I don't know, I guess it cuts off and it doesn't really matter, but it says, my administration has launched a global campaign, this is the scary part, to decriminalize homosexuality and invite all nations to join us in this effort. What basically what President Trump is saying is two things. Number one, it is true that it should be criminalized because that's actually in accordance with the Word of God. But number two, that he's actually looking to go against God. So that might lead to a hatred of God and say that we need to decriminalize this all around the world. 
Okay? And then the other thing that the U.S. is infamous for is playing, you know, the moral compass of the world. Each country should have its own ability to choose and decide what to do, but apparently the U.S. has to go and tell them what to do. Here's the actual tweet. It says, uh, as we celebrate LGBT, LGBT whatever, uh, Pride Month and recognize the outstanding contributions LGBT, LGBT people have made to our great nation, let us stand in solidarity with many LGBT people who live in dozens of countries worldwide that punish, imprison, or even execute individuals. So the same guy who said that he's for religious freedom, when that's an actual real thing, the world will persecute us, the world will attack us, the, will, the world is attacking Christians across the world. He's on one hand, he's saying, look, I'm going to take care of you guys. But on the other hand, he's saying, I'm going to take, and guess who's going to win out? If push comes to shove, guess who Trump's going to side with? Not with God. I can guarantee you that because if you're a man of God, you would never even write this, this tweet. It says, on the basis of their sexual orientation, my administration has launched a goal. Oh, well, you, you already read all that. I'm sorry. I'm being redundant. But then we see here that they're like, well, this is great, you know, that he did this. Oh, and then they give us a little bit of, uh, they give us a little bit of, of history. It says, LGT, LGBTQ, so up here it was just LG, LGBT, uh, LGBT, but now they added the Q. They can't even make up. There's got, they got so many acronyms. And it says here, uh, was established by Clinton in 1999. Though back, when it, back then it was called Gay and Lesbian Pride Month. It's amazing that it came during the time when you had an individual who did some pretty lewd things in the Oval Office and then try to write them off as a semantics. You know, what is, and I'm not going to go into the details. You, if you're old enough to remember what happened, you're old enough to remember what he said. And then uh, he signed it, and then supposedly, which, you know, this is all just smoke and mirrors, uh, uh, the Bush administrations didn't really celebrate it. But then Bush declined to recognize June as Pride Month, and it was not until the election of Barack Obama that the tradition started again. Then Obama issued a proclamation every year he was in office. And then guess what? They've continued that proclamation. I looked it up and it's there on the, you know, the Washington.gov website. And then, um, and, and then uh, you know, it just continues on about uh, telling us more. I guess it closes out with, during lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Pride Month, we celebrate the proud legacy LGBT, LGBT, LGBT individuals have woven into the fabric of our nation. You're talking about, you know, that they've abused and pedophilia, and hurt, and murder, and disease. We honor those that have fought to perfect our union, and we continue to work to build society where every child, it's amazing that they, that they throw that in there, grows up knowing that their country supports them, is proud of them, and has a place for them exactly as they are. That's not true, because every child is either a female or a male, and they're looking to confuse them. And the Bible tells us clearly that God is not the author of confusion. But enough of that. I just wanted to make sure I covered that, because uh, I thought it was important that uh, we, we stand against this and we speak, uh, speak loudly against it, against it. But let's go to Proverbs 16, verse 1. And right there in the Bible, the Bible reads, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And it's consistent with the verses we will use against the Sodomites, like in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20:13, And when we talk about Genesis 19 and we uh, talk about Judges 19 and we see where the Sodomites are removed in the books of Kings and we see the references in Romans 1 and we see the references in Jude and in, in 2 Peter, you know, it's very consistent that it's an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. A man's heart deviseth his ways, but the Lord directeth his steps. A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth, transgresseth not in judgment. A just weight and a balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are, bag are his works. It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. 
Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh. The wrath of a king is a messenger of death, but, but a wise man will pacify it. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is in a cloud of the latter rain. How much better <clears throat> is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. The reason I chose so many verses, because this is just a great contrast what the what the God says here, you know, pride goeth before destruction. Look, a nation that is not only celebrating this pride, but is openly saying that they're proud of this, is setting it up, it's setting itself up for destruction. And guess what? If you live here, you're you're probably going to witness it. We might even have to go through some of it. It's it's uh, it, you're due. You know, I remember in sales. You know, if you were in a slump or even in in a, in, a, in sports. You know, if you ever watch baseball, you get a good slugger and he's in a slump. And what do they say? Well, you know, he's been in a slump for long, long quite a while. He's been in a slump for, I don't know, 10, 15 games, whatever it is. But he's just going to keep swinging away. And guess what? Today's the day because he's due. And then eventually they'll hit a hit or a home run or something. Everybody's like, it, it, it makes sense because he was due. Well, look, pride goeth before destruction. And we've been doing this for quite some time. At least documented since about the early 2000s. So over 20, almost 20 years, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so what do we expect? What do we expect? You know, Trump gets up there, and, and the world gets up there and says that we've got a great nation, and that we're the economic, you know, beacon of the world, and that, you know, the economy's great, and everything's great, and everybody's great. But the Bible says, look, you're getting ready for destruction and for a fall. And so what we have to do to protect our families, and what we have to do to protect ourselves is, better it is to be of a humble spirit I love that word spirit because the only way you can even get a humble spirit is to have the spirit of Christ living in you with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. In other words, stop bringing them in. Stop accepting them. Stop saying that it's okay to be with them. Like so many churches here in Texas and so many churches throughout this country that just bring them in and say, look, we accept everybody. We love everybody. You, walk, you drive down Houston, you'll see these, uh, you know, the... The yard signs that say, you know, everybody's welcome, it's usually in a rainbow color sign. Those people are not Christians. Those are not Christian churches. Those do not believe the Word of God. Those are not biblical in their, their approach. Go to Mark. Go to Mark 7. You know, we see that Jesus has the same, the same belief about this. Go to Mark 7. And, and obviously, this is a very basic study of humility and pride. Because if you were to just do a basic, uh, if you just have any Bible software or you can you, you document it, if you look up the word humility or humble or humble, then you look up the word pride or proud or prideful or boastful. I mean, it's everywhere in the Bible. You're not, you, you could just spend hours and hours upon hours talking about this subject. You know, you just have to be specific and give like one, one uh, truth uh, when you're preaching. And so here's the truth about, you know, where we have to head. <clears throat> Mark 7, verse 1, and I'm going to read several verses for you. We're going to go down all the way to verse 22, but I think it's important to cover a lot of this because I didn't want to go to uh, just quote and quote and quote. Anyways, this is what we're, we're preaching on. Verse 1 says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with, def uh, with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of the table, end of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, hath this eye is prophesied of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What's interesting is I hear a lot of people, 
you know, on the right side of the Bible and on the wrong side of the Bible that they, they use this verse, you know, uh, <clears throat> right here in verse 7, where they're teaching for the doctrines of commandment of man. Look, this is a very, I think, in, there's not a lot of uh, verses that to me stand out as very simple, but this is a very simple uh, verse to understand. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, then it's a doctrine of man. If a church or a group of people say that you have to accept a certain lifestyle, but the Bible specifically says it doesn't, then, then the argument is made that if you are promoting that lifestyle from behind a pulpit, you are doing it for the doctrines of men. That's pretty simple. That's it. That's about as far as it goes. Because, you know, sometimes, especially in the, in the new independent fundamental Baptist movement or the NIFB or in this group of, of pastors, you know, they'll, they'll try to point to certain pastors as like the Pope or, or their leader, or they'll say that guy's their, their boss or this guy's their boss, and then they go to this, you know, teaching for the doctrines of men. But there's a couple of things that stand out. Is number one, this group of churches that is under attack by, this, by uh, the Sodomites and the world and by false religions, they're a group of independent Baptist churches. And number two, if you look at them, you know, they stand on the, on the Word of God. For the most part, and you know, I don't agree with them 100%. Plus, they would probably wouldn't agree with me. But we could 100% agree on one thing. We might not understand everything in the Bible exactly the same, but their sole authority, as is mine, is the Word of God. And on that, we can agree, and we could probably even come to similar conclusions after a while if we just kept reading the Word together. You know, the Word is what guides us. The Word is what leads us. But let's keep reading on there. It says in verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Fool, we reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of God of none effect through your vein, I mean through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. But basically what he's saying is, look, you guys are getting up here, and you're saying Trump's your guy, and I'm only picking on Trump because, I, because we've got it here, but Trump's your guy, and... The Bible says that's not the way, but we say it's the way. Basically making the Bible none effect. And what you end up doing is you're leading people astray if you don't stand on the Word of God. You know, one of the arguments I got this week as I was out soul winning is that, you know, I was reading this book and that it was my opinion that this is the way to get saved and that there's other books that say different things. And I, I, and I actually got a little flustered and I got a little tough on the individual. And I said, absolutely not my opinion. Absolutely not what I think. As a matter of fact, that's why we go through Scripture and show you what the Word of God says. This is God's truth. This is not His opinion. This is a fact. As a matter of fact, I don't have an opinion when it comes to salvation because when I had an opinion, it definitely wasn't saved by grace and it wasn't for eternity. That's why I was a Seventh-day Adventist for such a long time and lost in the world. It wasn't until God's truth pricked at my heart that I realized that it's God's way or the highway. So let's go ahead and just keep uh, reading there. And uh, it says, uh, And when he called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering in can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If a man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever things from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? And you know why? Because if you're saved by grace, even disease, even, uh, let's say we, we have a deathly disease, it's just the flesh. Our lives are eternal. Because it, uh, verse 19, Because it entereth not in, in, into his heart, but in the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all, purging, uh, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, 
thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, and lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. And so we see that this is Jesus explaining what it is that comes out and defiles a man. And it's these, these acts and these thoughts, sometimes they start out as a thought, but then you act on them, it's even worse. Right? And, um, and, and my message is not only against those, I mean, they're given up, but my message is the reason that they're puffed up and prideful is because there's not enough pastors in America and in the world preaching against this that'll get them to crawl back into their little holes and never come out again to see the, the, the light of day. You know, go uh, turn, if you will, to Exodus 10. While I read for you real quick, uh, 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that the, is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, there's no way around it. Pride Month is about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, I want to abide forever. I want to do the will of God. And, then, and the Bible says it's not easy. It's very clear. We're not, that's not the sermon I'm preaching today. But if we were to look, you know, the greats in the Bible, it wasn't easy. I mean, the, the easiest example I can think of is Joseph. Joseph, before he became the second in command, I mean, he had it pretty rough. You know, he was accused, uh, you know, of adultery. He was sold for, for uh, uh, and he, told, he was th thought to be murdered. And then he went to prison, you know, and he suffered many things before he became the second in command. But he rather would abide with God forever than to give into the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, you know, and the pride of life. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. So let's look at uh, humility. And because, and, and, you know, we talked about pride and what it does. So how do we combat this? Well, we, we've got to humble ourselves. You know, that famous uh, verse is, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. And he's talking specifically to, If my people. And humbling ourselves is something that we have to do by being obedient to God's word. You know, it's not, as, uh, it's not like the world thinks that sometimes, you know, Catholics have, uh, it, you know, it's the, the, picture that, uh, the picture that comes to my mind the most vividly. You know, when Catholics talk about humility, you would imagine a bunch of people coming in here with, you know, bloody knees crawling to kiss a, a statue, uh, you know, and worshiping the devil. But the Bible has a different definition of humility. But let's look at it real quick, and I like this, that's why I did it. You know, the Bible gives, I mean, the Bible, the dictionary, excuse me for the mistake, but there, the, the, the dictionary gives us two different types of definitions. We're looking at an adjective for humble. It's a low, opposed, too high, or lofty. So it's basically the opposite, uh, not magnificent, lowly, modest, meek, submissive, opposed to proud, haughty, arrogant, or assuming. In an evangelical sense, having a low opinion of oneself and a deep sense of unworthiness in the sight of God. But then when, you see, when they use it as a verb, uh, transitive, uh, is to reduce to a low state, to crush, to break, to subdue, uh, to mortify, to make humble or lowly in mind, to abase. And so and we see this in the Bible, you're either humble in spirit or God will humble you. There's no way about it. The Bible says that every knee shall bow. So humility is going to come even to the prideful and the haughty, whether they like it or not. But let me tell you something. I would much rather seek to be humble. And, and let me tell you, I'm not telling you I'm humble. I'm seeking it. You know, this is something that we're working at. But I would much rather be on that road than on the road of the haughty and the prideful. And the only way to do that is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you, right? Exodus 10.1 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in, up unto, go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. And let me just set this up. This is where he's going to start the plagues. You know, as Moses has, has been commanded to lead the people out of Egypt into the wilderness and then into the promised land, he, here the Lord is speaking to Moses. And he says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go into, in unto Pharaoh, for I have, I have hardened, the heart of, uh, hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the years of thy son and of thy son's son, 
what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know that I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. I mean, what we see here is that God is the one who hardened them. You know, when we're talking about the reprobate mind, when we're talking about those that are given up, God's the one that hardened them. And, and, and it's our commandment to go out there and fight for our people. You know, Moses, he said, he's telling Moses, that thou mayest tell in the years of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt. Look, we're still talking about the things that Jesus did in Egypt's time because the destruction is coming to America and we better be ready for it. And the only way to really be ready for it is to preach from the pulpits and to lead others to Christ. And I mean, you can change the order, but I think that if you just lead people to Christ and you're not preaching hard from the Bible, we're not going to solve the problem. And if you're preaching hard from the Bible but you're not going out soul winning, we're not going to solve the problem. I think the problem is all of it. You know, and I did a whole sermon on that about how it's everything. He commanded us to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was, it was the salvation, but it's also the discipleship. You know, and that's a whole other message all in itself. Go to, J, uh, go to James, and I'll read for you Matthew. Go to James chapter 4, and Matthew 18 says, And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, to have a humble mind... It's to have a childlike mentality to Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean as men, we act as men. It says, when I was a child, I did as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. But before God, we come with a humble spirit. We come with a submissive spirit to be obedient to the word of God. But he's telling them here, and the reason I picked this is because he gives very specific punishment for attacking uh, not only little children, but God's children. It says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as his little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me? But who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. I'm going to tell you, in this Pride Month, it would be better that we took a bunch of millstones and manufactured them in mass production and hung them around people's, those pedophiles and those perverts' necks and send them to the bottom of the sea. Now, the Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not something that we do. I'm not espousing that our church go out there and do that. If we had a righteous government, that's what they would do. You know, people will twist the words, you know, in the fight against the truth, and they will say that we're radical and that we're extremists. I am radical in that I believe that the Bible is my sole authority. And I am extreme and I'm saying that this is an extreme decision. It's black and white. But I will be obedient to the word of God. And he says, for I wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it's not my duty to go out there and physically wrestle this. But it is my duty to wrestle against the spirit. And that's why we go so winning. And that's why we preach the word of God. And that's why we hope to prick the heart and to have a, the, the word of God be a two-edged sword, you know, uh, dividing asunder. Let's go to James 4, verse 6. It said, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. So you want grace? Get a humble attitude Good, because God resisted the proud. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. You notice it's not a point of weakness. Yet To resist the devil, you have to have some strength and courage, and he will flee from you. You know how we get these, these uh, sickos, these sycophants, these perverts to flee from us? We resist them. The Bible says if we resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to, nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Uh, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Go to, ye, go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live 
and do this or that, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that, that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, we're all in different stages in our, in our Christian growth, but as the Bible speaks to you, you know, it's not your choice to nitpick. If you don't agree with something in the Bible, well, then you have to disagree with yourself. I mean, that's the, that, that's the easiest way to say it. If there's something in the Bible that I read, read or have read in the past that just didn't make sense or I didn't agree with it, you know, the only thing that I have to do is be obedient to God and that spirit will take care of that. But the reality is here he's talking about uh, these guys who go in there and they come into cities and, you know, Trump says that our economy is great and we're going to go doing this and such boasting is evil. It says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. Well, one of the things that we know to do good is to preach the entire counsel of God. And, and we're going to be preaching about this, or at least I will, for the next couple of weeks, this whole month. There's plenty of time for me to preach on many subjects, but this is the month to preach against this because the Bible says that we need to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Go to 1 Peter 5, and we're almost done here. Go to 1 Peter 5, verse 1. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who, who, am, also, who am also an elder and witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, nor not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. This is a warning to, to the, the, the preacher, the pastor, to feed the flock and to make sure that he's doing it for the right reasons. It says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. There we see that phrase again. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That he may exalt you in due time. Too many times we want the spotlight, but the spotlight's not ready for us. What God says is, look, you just humble yourselves, and he will exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I love that. I love that ending right there, perf that he will make you perfect, complete you, that he will establish you, he will ground you, and you will know who you are in Christ, that he will strengthen you so that you can resist the devil. And I love that last part, settle you. You know, I, I grew up in, in a family that we weren't saved. You know, we had good moral uh, upbringing, good moral backgrounds. But one of the things that, that uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been around a lot of Hispanics, Hispanics tend to be a little paranoia. You know, they have fences and they put bars around their houses. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know if it's because the criminal activity in Mexico is just worse. Or when they come here, they, they just kind of act the same. And so one of the things that, that ends up developing is if you train that paranoia, you, you tend to have anxiety. And so one of the things that I've had to fight in my adulthood, at, and especially in my new, my new spirit, is anxiety. And I love that because what does the, 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 the Lord do for you? He settles you. You know, if you do things in a panic, if you do things in, in, a, in a moment of, of, of quick fear or not thinking things through, you're going to make mistakes. But if you're established and strengthened and settled in the Lord, you're able to resist the devil. You know, the, the world will try to make you feel like, like you're doing something wrong. They, can, they make you guilty before proven innocent. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty. That's the way it should be. But the world, the way that they're shoving down this hate speech and the way they're brainwashing you to think that everything's hate or love and that there's no in between and that if you hate something well, then you're some kind of terrorist some mind terrorist some radical that should you know you, you I was listening to some guy you know there's a lot of uh, people that are against this uh, make America straight uh, uh, conference and there was this guy that it was a snippet that I heard and he's like 
the minute that you espouse for the killing of a minority group, first of all, they're not even a, like a racial minority. They're just a minority in the sense that they're the smallest group of people that live this wicked lifestyle. But I don't, you know, when I think of a minority, I'm thinking like people talk about racial minorities. But anyways, and he's saying you've lost your right to speak, to have free speech. Well, I'm going to tell you something. When God gives me rights to have authority to preach the word of God, I don't need anybody's permission to preach the word of God. And neither do you. And you should be, you know, perfect, established, strengthened, and settled in the word of God. Let's go ahead and close this, you know, with, with, the, the, uh, with the finality. And it's like, look, if you're not humble, you're going to be humbled. If you're not looking for humility, God will humiliate you. You know, let's go to, uh, go to Matthew 23, and I'll just read for you Proverbs, and then we're going to be in Romans um, 14. But uh, right there in Romans 24, verse 19 says, Fret not thyself because of evil men. Now, I'm preaching against this because it needs to be preached on. But these individuals, they don't cause me any fear. I don't lose any sleep over them. I'm going to protect my family and do whatever it takes to make sure that they're uh, safe. And I know that God will provide where I, where I may fail. So the Bible tells me, fret not thyself because of evil men. Neither be thou envious at the wicked, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Go to Matthew 23, 1. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do, but do ye not after their works, for they say and do not, for they bind heavy burns and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the upper, uh, uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in, in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father, Upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your Master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Um, excuse me, exalted. And so we see here a picture of these religious, uh, basically, narcissists. And I'm preaching against these guys because they're the ones that, that are helping promote this kind of filth. And it says, look, whoever exalts himself shall be abased. But you can apply this to even just all these prideful individuals. God will humble them. And he says, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let's go ahead and close out with Romans 14, verse 9. It says, for to this end both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord, might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why? Does thou judge thy brother, and why does thou said at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, and it's my prayer, and it's my hope that our account to God is an account of standing on the word of God on being established and strengthened and settled in the Word of God, willing to fight to the bitter end, instead of being humbled, being forced to... See, look, I'm looking forward to the day when I bow down before the, the name of Jesus. I want to bow down before the name of Jesus. He is my Lord and Savior. I don't want to be bowed down. Because the minute you, you do that, you know you're in trouble. You know, and he says there... As it is written, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess. So even all these individuals that are atheists, that live this wicked lifestyle, that promote this, they're going to have to suffer this vengeance. Now we know that that's what they're doing, but the reason that we have to preach against this is so we can remove that feeling that they've caused in people that are going astray. They're not kind people. They're not loving. They're not you know, out there for, to help you be better and grow better and laid down their life for you. They're there to kill. They're there to murder. They're there to abuse. They're there to violate. They're there to just, you know, do all kinds of wicked and perverse things, and it needs to be stopped. So, you know, I would much rather, if we're looking at the contrast, fight for humility than look at pride. And we need to know two things about pride. Number one, you know, if, if you're uh, 
take heed for yourself. You know, examine yourself if you think there's any pride in you. But number two, we better be ready for the oncoming destruction. This country right now is a president who's full of pride. We have a nation that's full of pride. We have people that are haughty, and the Bible tells us that it's a, it, it leads to destruction and a fall. So that is eminent. You know, you got a bunch of Christians that say that we're waiting for the eminent return of Christ. I think you better be ready for the eminent destruction of the world, the eminent destruction of America, and you better go out there and preach the gospel to every soul in every nation and to every corner and the highways and, and hedges and to everybody that you can because this is coming and we better stand on the word of God. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to preach here tonight. Uh, Lord, just help us to resist the devil so that he may flee from us. Give us a humble spirit, Lord. Help us to continue to work in that humility. You know, I learned a long time ago that if you think yourself humble, you're not humble. You're actually arrogant. So, Lord, uh, you know, I don't know where that point is. I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers. But I do know that if we just seek you and we allow you to be uh, the Lord in our life, the, the boss, the, the one who directs our paths, that will create humility in us and help us to not only do that, but lead our families in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and to train up our children in the way that they should go, which is the way of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.